Oops. Got to try to juggle everything. Do a mask on or off in the background? Um, off is fine. Okay. As long as we're distanced. We're on way okay. distanced. We're good to go? Wonderful to be here at Redcliffe Hospital with the local member, uh, member for Bancroft as well, Chris Whiting, and we are here celebrating the announcement in uh, the Queensland budget of $1.06 billion uh, for the expansion of the Redcliffe Hospital. This means an additional 204 beds, but more importantly, it also means a new ambulatory bay a building, a new clinical building, and it means refurbishment of the existing facilities as well. This is an almost doubling of the capacity of Redcliffe Hospital, uh, planning for the future growth that we know is occurring in the Moreton Bay region. We know plenty of people on the north side of Brisbane choose to come out to Redcliffe for their services, including our wonderful maternity services, and so it's so important that we be planning now and investing now for that growth into the future. But we also don't have to wait for that construction to start. We've already got millions of dollars of investment that's already occurred here and is occurring right now. Just to the right of me, there is construction fencing up and we are building the new $10 million paediatric emergency department. There'll be a separate waiting room and uh, paediatric beds, including short-stay beds uh, for children. And this will be a welcome addition uh, for this community and for this region, uh, with those works due to be completed and operational by mid next year. Uh, not only will these beds and the new facilities support this community, but while that construction is occurring, it will support over two and a half thousand construction jobs as well, uh, which is certainly uh, exciting for this local community. I'm sure lots of local jobs in those works. Um, so I do want to uh, thank Metro North Hospital and Health Service for uh, their tremendous work and all of the health workers at Redcliffe Hospital and across the hospital system uh, for the work that they've been doing tirelessly day in, day out, including through COVID. We know today we've again uh, got over 500 patients uh, who are positive with COVID uh, being cared for right now across our public hospital systems. I'm hearing and I met with the health ministers uh, and the Commonwealth Health Minister on Friday in Canberra. Uh, we know that we're hearing that this wave uh, that we're in, the third wave, could end up peaking higher than we saw the second wave uh, and we are not at that peak yet. Uh, so that means we've got extra strain on our system again. Uh, we've got over 1,500 staff furloughed again. Uh, and we ask for everyone's patients as our hospitals, our health staff, do their best to look after everyone uh, in these very trying times. I do remind people about vaccinations. It is important you get your COVID uh, vaccine. We know two uh, vaccines are not enough. It is important people get their boosters, whether it's their third booster or their fourth booster, depending on your eligibility. Uh, with this new wave and these new variants, BA4 and 5, uh, people could get COVID again. So please don't be complacent just because you've had COVID once and you may have got through that quite well. Please don't assume you won't get COVID again and you won't become uh, seriously unwell. So please get those vaccinations. And of course, the flu vaccine, which has been extended for another couple of weeks, I encourage people to get their flu shot. And I've just seen reports uh, about uh, the first diphtheria case that this country has seen uh, in over a century in a two-year-old child in New South Wales. So we know that vaccinations make a difference. They help eradicate diseases 
and if we become complacent when it comes to immunisation, including our children, then these terrible diseases can come back. So I have a general message for the community around vaccinations. They are important, they make a difference uh, and they save lives. We'll now hear from Chris Whiting and then happy to take some questions. Thanks. Thank you, Yvette. Redcliffe Hospital, a redevelopment of over $1 billion, an extra 204 beds. Caboolture Hospital, $400 million redevelopment, essentially doubling the size of the ED. The Palaszczuk government really is delivering a better and improved healthcare system across this very fast growing region. And I know that is a huge priority for our government and it's a huge priority for local people to see that happen. No, there's, there's no change in masks. I know that uh, the Chief Health Officer said the other day that there was discussions occurring uh, at AHPPC level. Uh, all health ministers got a briefing from the Deputy Chief Medical Officer on Friday about the current wave. Uh, there is no recommendation at this point that we reintroduce mandatory masks. Uh, and I don't have any uh, recommendation from the Chief Health Officer here in Queensland to do that. Uh, but we do remind people as we go through this third wave uh, that they can you know, make those decisions themselves. I know just about everyone carries a mask with them, uh, whether it's in your, your car or your handbag or whatever else. And so if people feel like they're in a situation where they can't socially distance uh, and they are particularly vulnerable, then you know, by all means wear a mask. Uh, and we still see plenty of people wearing masks. Uh, sometimes it's because they've just come out of isolation themselves or they're living in a household with someone who's positive. And I, um, I thank those people for doing the right thing and wearing those masks in those situations. Yeah. yeah, it's certainly, we need to remind ourselves that COVID globally is still having an impact. People are still dying every single day uh, around this country. Our health workers, our doctors, our nurses, are treating and caring for your loved ones who have COVID. Uh, they are still in isolation. Uh, those people cannot have any other uh, visitors and that means they're solely reliant on that care uh, and that comfort from our health workers. But our health workers would prefer to not have to be caring people who are seriously unwell from COVID, who are in ICU and sadly, uh, who are passing away every week. Uh, and there's something we can do to at least ease the burden on our health workers who are deal dealing with these COVID deaths, and that is uh, getting vaccinated and encouraging our loved ones to get vaccinated. Yeah. Yeah, so each hospital makes their own decisions and hospital and health service around um, flexing up and down around planned care and demand pressures, uh, staffing, because you know, we, we have different demands as far as how many COVID patients we have in any given hospital and how many staff are furloughed. So at this stage, those decisions are still being made at the HHS and at the local hospital level. Uh, there's no decision at this point or recommendation to look at any suspension of planned care across the state, but that could occur. Uh, that could occur if we start seeing numbers uh, reaching up to as high as what we saw in the first wave or potentially beyond that. Uh, but at this stage, we, we don't know where it's going to peak. I'm being told we haven't peaked yet. Uh, that could be um, you know, another couple of weeks away, if not more. Uh, and you know, there could be future waves. So you know, all of those options are on the table. We still have those really strong relationships with our private hospitals as well. Uh, and making sure that the private hospitals have bed capacity as well if we need to call on that. Look, there, there's no specific threshold. You know, every wave's been different and different things happening in our community. We will take the advice of the health officers as we always do. Uh, so if the chief health officer, if AHPPC, uh, believe that masks should start being worn, whether it's in individual states or, or it's a national uh, conversation, then we'll certainly follow that advice. But at this stage, uh, we don't have that advice. And I think in part, it's because we are moving more too. We're gonna keep having waves. 
uh, you know, we don't know when the end's going to be. We're going to be living with COVID for a very long time in society. So we do need to move to a more business as usual. And that means people taking um, their own responsibility about wearing masks when they feel that they are in a situation where they're at greater risk or they're more vulnerable. Yes, again, um, aged care is very much a Commonwealth responsibility uh, and each aged care centre will manage any outbreaks they have. I'm also mindful we've had some outbreaks uh, in disability providers as well and we've been stepping in and supporting those disability providers who feel they don't have um, the uh, capability of managing a COVID outbreak. Uh, so we'll continue to provide support to aged care. Uh, this was an issue again we raised with the Commonwealth last week, disability and aged care. Uh, they continue to need support uh, and you know, I welcome the fact that we've had our COVID NPA, our National Partnership Agreement funding, extended to the end of this year because we know uh, that COVID isn't over yet. Just quickly on uh, Karen Williams, do you know if the Deputy Premier has sought that advice if the government does have the power to remove her? Um, look, I'm only aware of the reports that have been made today saying that the Deputy Premier was seeking uh, additional advice uh, and as uh, the local minister, uh, that's you know, certainly his prerogative to do that. I'm not aware if he's got that advice or not as yet. If it turns out that we don't, or the government doesn't have the power to remove a mayor under these circumstances, do you think uh, the government would look at broadening the, the scope to remove someone if they're charged with the drink driving level of this? Um, look, we've gone through a lot of uh, reviews and work around uh, local government. Uh, we followed the recommendations of the Triple C in relation to that. Um, you know, it's again up to the Deputy Premier if he wants to bring forward to Cabinet any proposed changes. I'm not aware of any suggestion at this stage. But ultimately, when it comes to these things, uh, each and every person has to take a responsibility for their own actions, uh, elected official or not. Uh, when we're elected official, we get held to a higher standard, and it really is up to the Mayor to make decisions around you know, taking responsibility for the decisions she made. Are you surprised she hasn't stepped down yet? Um, again, that is her choice, uh, but for, as someone who has advocated so strongly about uh, stronger laws and sentencing around drink driving, I am quite shocked uh, that she made the decision to get behind a wheel. But she's got to take responsibility for that action. The courts will also deal with any matter, and I'm not going to talk about those particular matters um, because they, they will be before the courts. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, no matter what uh, decisions the Deputy Premier makes, uh, electors will decide at the next election if she is still in that job at that point. Uh, no, but um, yeah, I've asked all of our hospital and health services to be looking at what more we can be doing to support women. Uh, at a uh, local level, at a regional level around termination of pregnancy uh, services. It's been very difficult since Maui Stopes uh, closed their regional uh, sites and I've been working with our HHSs. I was in Townsville last week uh, where Townsville uh, announced $1 million uh, for their programs. I welcome that and uh, you know, I do hope that other HHSs will follow and provide those services where they've got the capability to do so. Um, look, I, I haven't had a, a briefing as yet in relation to uh, what's come out of the most recent report, but as uh, everyone is aware, uh, we've got a comprehensive review going on into uh, the forensic services right now, and I you know, will await the finding of that report. And I have no doubt they'll also look as at um, previous recommendations and what has been implemented and what hasn't and why. Well, as I said before, when it comes to uh, the planned care, at this stage, 
uh, hospital and health services and individual hospitals are making those decisions because you know some hospitals have more COVID patients and more staff furloughed than others do. Uh, so there isn't a recommendation at this point uh, to implement a statewide uh, suspension of planned care, uh, but individual hospitals will uh, you know, move up and down the tiers, which might mean that there might be temporary uh, suspension of some surgeries to deal with those demands and those uh, staff shortages. That's everything. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, you want to do something? Yeah.